Hi guys, um, we're going to go ahead and do uh, one more video today. Um, we're going to be in Ezekiel 33. And um, this is, well, I'd like to say this is a really good one. They're all really good, but I really like this one. And so um, we're going to go ahead and finish it. Um, chapter 33, let's open up in prayer. Lord God, we thank you so much for the time and opportunity that you've given us today to just delve into your word. And I just pray that you would open our hearts and our minds and speak to us and help us to glean from your word and see um, how it applies to us and how we can use it in our life and be the people that you've called us to be and live in a way that's pleasing to you. We thank you, Lord God, let your anointing go forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. 33 and 1. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man from their coasts and pick him to be their watchman, we're going to pause. What's a watchman? So we talked about earlier in earlier chapters, um, if you've been reading these, we did it with Jeremiah and different things. That um, So in this time period, in Bible times, the cities, um, in order for um, to be protected, they were surrounded by walls. And I don't mean like a wall in your house. Um, thick, thick brick, some just huge brick walls. To the point where some of them were so massive that it, they'd have like um, horses and chariots running around on the top of it. So it was pretty, it was thick. And so um, they would have uh, like military stations up there and there would be guards along the wall. And they would take shifts, okay? Um, and it would start at six in the evening. Um, usually that's like sundown. And um, so six, nine... 12, 3, 6. So every three hours, there would be a shift change and new guards would come. So they would patrol the walls, you know, um, with weapons and stuff and, and watch and make sure no one was breaking into the city, no one, you know, things like that. And so it was their responsibility that when they saw danger coming, they would warn the people. And um, especially in the law of Moses, um, in Israel, and I'm sure all the other countries had their own thing, but they had um, different, like, you know, there would be this particular trumpet sound for an invading army. It'd be this particular sound for, you know, a coming storm. And we're going to blow this particular tune on the trumpet to start a fast or a celebration. So there were all different things. And of course the people would learn them all and what they were. So they knew, you know, like when you go into a store and it's like code this and code that, you know, they know themselves what it means and they're sending out a warning. And so the watchmen were like guards and soldiers that um, patrolled on top of the walls to make sure everything was safe. So God is saying, um, you know, that people will come in and people will be selected to be a watchman. So if someone takes a watchman in verse three, if when he sees the sword coming to the land, he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and doesn't listen to the warning. If the sword comes and kills him, his blood will be upon his own head. That's his own problem. Because the watchman blasted the sound, gave the warning, and he didn't listen. Verse 5. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but he didn't listen. He did not take warning. His blood will be upon him, but... He that takes warning will deliver his soul. He'll save his soul. You know, you um, if someone gives a weather report that a tornado or a hurricane is coming, some people, you know, unfortunately, they're, I've been here all my life and it's not going to be anything. And then they die. You know, because a warning was given and they thought they knew better. 
And they took their chances and it cost them their life. Okay, verse 6. But if the watchman sees the sword coming, so he sees uh, an invading army coming, it does not blow the trumpet. And the people aren't warned. If the sword comes and anyone is killed, they will be killed in their own iniquity, but their blood will be required at the watchman's hand. Now, I read this because I was like, wait a minute. It says, if the sword comes and kills anybody, they will be taken. They will be killed in their iniquity. So how, how is it their fault? Why would it say they would be killed in their own iniquity? Like, what did they do wrong? So I looked it up and, and I looked into this and it, and it made a lot more sense. Um, <clears throat> so it was actually very rare for there to be a complete and total surprise attack. No one knew it was coming. That was very rare because it was very common. And you see this um, in the book of Isaiah uh, with Hezekiah. Um, Sennacherib, um, I believe that was the king of, of Assyria. So what they were doing, usually what they would do is when it was like this uh, kingdom like Babylon, some big dude, okay, some big kingdom, mighty, what they will do is they will initially send people, a couple spokesmen ahead of them to try to negotiate terms of surrender. Like, look, bro, we're going to annihilate you, okay? So... If you want to do this easy, you want to take this the easy way, we can make a covenant and you surrender and we won't kill you and we'll let you keep some of your land, you know, and make these terms of agreement. So you had some knowledge because they were sending people ahead of them before they attacked you. So um, it was very rare that there was a complete and total, total, oh my goodness, we just didn't know this was coming because that's just not how it was set up back then, how they did things. OK, um, they didn't do it like we do it nowadays, even when um, I remember um, my son and I homeschooled. And when we, uh, you know, you learn about like the Revolutionary War, you know, even for the United States, when we fought Great Britain to become our own nation, um, a lot of them were killed because how they did things, you know, over in Europe and in that part of the world you know, how a battle was fought. You can see it even throughout the Bible. So these two armies would come out onto the battlefield, you know, and, and present themselves. And, you know, a lot of times that's what happened. And then and they would just, you know, go to war. So you had these massive armies coming from Great Britain and come out on with their pomp and their cannon, blast, you know, the cannons and stuff onto the battlefield well here's the native americans and they just hiding in the bushes picking people off left there because they didn't fight the same way and so even as recently as that you know um just you know a little over 200 years ago it's still like things were done so differently than they are now whereas now you know yeah we got like snipers and stuff like that but they didn't do that it wasn't very common back then they were all their wars were like out in the open or um when they come to a battle they like besiege a city and surround we talked about that they cut off the water supply that can go on for a year or more and so there it's very rare that there's that much of a surprise attack so I said all that to say in verse six, when it says, if the watchman doesn't blow the trumpet and the people are sleeping and they aren't warned and they die, they're going to die in their own iniquity, but the watchman's going to be responsible. What the Bible meant in their own iniquity is because you knew that this was a time of war. You had some knowledge. So, it would be common sense, even per household, you would have shifts of people staying up at night, kind of keep an eye on what's like, because we're not, you can't sleep on the enemy. Ha ha, that'll preach. You can't sleep while you know the enemy is lurking around. You got to have in your own house, take initiative, fight for your family. Don't just sit there and let the devil come in, the enemy, whatever the case is, and take it. You got to be up there watching 
paying attention. And so if it was a time, and that's when they started off saying, actually going back to verse two, if it's a time of war and I'm bringing a sword upon the land. So this ain't a surprise attack. This was a time of war. You should have loved your family, cared about your household enough that you had shifts being done even in your own house to pay attention and to stay awake and to not sleep on the job when your country was about ready to fall into the hands of another invading army. You should have been awake. So that's what that meant. Verse 7, so you, now God is going to make this personal. This is what I talk about when we read different chapters. How does this apply to me? What can I do? What can I learn from this? What is it? So now God spent these first, you know, several verses talking to Ezekiel about something he was familiar with, these watchmen that patrol the walls, and now God's going to bring it home. And verse 7 says, you, son of man, I have said you, you're the watchman, you're my watchman over the house of Israel. So what that guard soldier does in the natural, I have chosen you to do in the spiritual for you to warn people and sound that trumpet and warn people that my judgment is coming and let them know. Therefore, you shall hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Verse 8. When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you will surely die. If you don't speak to warn the wicked from his sins, from his way, that wicked man will die in his iniquity for what he's done. But you will be responsible for it. His blood I will require at your hand. You will answer. For that man's soul. You will be required. For that man's soul. This is heavy stuff you guys man. Heavy stuff. Because this applies to us. People in our life. Are we warning? Are we being a witness? Nevertheless. If you warn the wicked of his way, to turn from it. Stop living like that. Don't do this stuff. Don't go back to this person. Don't go there. Don't do drugs. Don't, whatever the case may be. Don't associate with those people. And you warn them, and he doesn't stop. He doesn't turn from his way. He will die in his sin, but you have delivered your soul. You, you've saved yourself. You covered your butt. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak. Go speak to the house of Israel. And this is what you shall say. If our transgressions and our sins are on us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? If you're being punished for your sins, how is that any way to live? Verse 11, say to them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Boy, <clears throat> that's really going to fly in the face of a lot of these people that are high on you know, just damning people to hell and preaching God's judgment and so quick to, you know, condemn. Here it is from God's own mouth. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God was not happy when Hitler died. Right here. We just read it. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. That is so much better. We talk about someone, you know, and sure, you know, it's a good situation when um, a pedophile gets justice. It'd be so much more better if that pedophile changed and didn't hurt anybody no more. 
whatever the case may be. It'd be so much better. You know, someone cheated and then, you know, um, they got, you know, put in their place. Well, no, it'd just be better that they didn't act like that way anymore. Forever is a very long time. And it is very much better for a soul to repent and come to God than to burn in hell for all eternity. Screaming and alone. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Why does it have to be this way? Why do you have to learn the hard way? God doesn't want to stand there and hand out all these punishments and judgments. Do you understand what it takes to get him to that point where we are now in our study in Ezekiel? The Israelites have been in their land that he gave them for hundreds of years. He has let them get away with this. And he couldn't anymore. Hundreds of years it took for him to finally break and do this. Why? Why does it have to be this way? Why, why do you have to lose your family in order for you to wake up? Why do you have to lose everything? Why does there have to be a rock bottom? Why do you got to be so thick in your head? Verse 12, Therefore thou, son of man, say to the children of your people, the righteousness of the righteous will not deliver him in the day of his transgressions. You can't say, well, I taught Sunday school for 20 years. Who the heck cares? Did you have a relationship with Jesus? Because that's all that's going to matter. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Doesn't matter a pedophile. If he changes and gives his heart to God and stops that nonsense, that stuff he did in his past will be erased and gone. Hallelujah. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sins. Well, I gave all my money to... Africa, the kids in Africa, so what? You cheated on your wife. Who cares? 13, when I say to the righteous that he will surely live, if he trusts to his own righteousness and commits iniquity, all the good things that he did will not be remembered in his defense. But for the iniquity that he did, for the wrong that he did, that's what he'll die for. Again, when I say to the wicked, you will surely die if he turns from his sin and does that which is lawful and right. And the wicked restore the pledge. He goes back to the word that he kept. He gives back what he took. He walked in the statutes of life without committing iniquity. He will live and he will not die. He'll not be punished because he changed. Verse 16, none of the sins that he committed will be mentioned to him. Shandari, my goodness. Do you know how beautiful that is, God? Whatever regrets you have in your past, you give your life to God and they are gone. Doesn't matter if you had an abortion. 
If you cheated, if you killed somebody, you give your heart to God. doesn't matter what you stole, if you lie, whatever you did, you come and you give your life to God. And those things are gone. And they will not be mentioned to you, against you anymore. Hallelujah. He has done what is lawful and right. He will surely live. Yet the children of your people say, the way of the Lord isn't fair. But as for them, their way is not fair. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits sin, he's going to die by it. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness, and does what is lawful and right, he will live by it. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, I will judge you, every one, according to your own ways. And it came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity, in the tenth month, in the fifth day of the month, that someone had escaped out of Jerusalem and ran to me and gave me word. I want to repeat this again before I tell you what that word was. It came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity. If you remember, at the ninth year of their captivity, Babylon went back to recapture Jerusalem because they continued to rebel. It was just a heyday. They were killing everybody there, still continuing in sin, still rebelling against the king of Babylon. And Jeremiah would warn them, if you don't, he's going to come do it, do worse than he did last time. You guys sure didn't learn. So nine took nine years. Bab king of Babylon went back, surrounded the city, at the 11th year mark, he broke, he went in there and demolished it even worse than the first time. Killed people, did even worse than he did before. That was the 11th year. So now here it is, the 12th year and the 10th month. They're still rebelling over there. Someone escaped from Jerusalem and came to me and gave me word. The city has been destroyed. Now the hand of the Lord was upon me in the evening before that person escaped and came and told me. All the way until he came to me in the morning and my mouth was opened and I was no more mute or dumb, King James says. If you remember, uh, there were times that God did that to Ezekiel where um, he literally closed his mouth and did not allow him to speak until he had a word for him to say. Verse 23, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, they that inhabit those waste places in the land of Israel, speak to them and say, Abraham was one man, but he inherited the land. And we are many. The land is given to us as an inheritance. So they thought, hey, we're going to do better than Abraham. They were so arrogant. They thought that they wouldn't lose the land. They thought that the city wouldn't be completely destroyed because the temple was there. So God brought Bab the king of Babylon there to destroy the temple and everything else in it. And they still didn't change. Verse 25, Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, You eat with the blood. That was forbidden in the law of Moses. They weren't allowed to eat the blood. You're eating with the blood. You lift up your eyes toward idols. You kill innocent people. And you think you're going to possess this land? You actually have the nerve to compare yourself to Abraham. 
really. Verse 6, 26, I'm sorry. You stand on your sword, you work abomination, and you defile everyone his neighbor's wife. And you think you're going to possess that land. So this is what you say to them. Thus saith the Lord God, as I live. Surely they that are in the wasted places will die by the sword. And him that is in the open field will I give to wild animals to be eaten. And whoever is hiding in the forest and in caves will die by the pestilence. And we learned that pestilence was a, a very bad plague, a deadly plague. For I will lay the land most desolate. You think King of Babylon did it bad. You ain't Tom done. And the pomp of her strength will stop. The mountains of Israel will be desolate and empty so that no one will even walk through it. Then shall they know that I am the Lord when I have laid the land most desolate because of all their abominations that they have committed. Also, thou son of man, the children of your people still are talking against you by the walls and in the doors of their houses and they're they're whispering to one another everyone to his brother saying come please and hear what is the word that comes forth from the lord they're mocking ezekiel and not listening to him so then they come to you like people come and they sit before you as if they were my people and they listen to your words but they won't do them for with their mouth they show much love but their heart goes after their covetousness, their greed. They don't. People are so two-faced and shallow, and there ain't nothing new under the sun. Acting like they're your friends, talking about you behind your back. And lo, God told Ezekiel, you are to them like a very beautiful song from someone who who has a most pleasant, lovely voice and can play well and so good on an instrument because they'll listen to your words, but they ain't going to do them. Oh, it's a beautiful song to listen to. Oh, I love these this verse of scripture. Won't listen to the other ones, but oh, yeah. So fake and shallow. Verse 33. And when this comes to pass, for behold, it will happen. And when this happens, because it's going to, then shall they know that a prophet has been among them. They won't know it now. One day they will. Some people are asleep right now. They're going to wake up someday. Let's hope it's not too late. Whatever God is laying on your heart for you to do, I pray that you would do it. That you wouldn't have to learn the hard way. That you wouldn't have a thick skull. That you would do what God has called you to do. That you would continue in righteousness and forsake sin. Because time is running short and there is not one thing in this earth that is worth getting between you and God. There's not. God is faithful and God is good. And he will fight for you. And he will put that sword in your hand. And he will teach you how to fight. The good fight. He is faithful and he will do it. God bless you guys. Bye-bye.